We knew that if we waited one more day, Benghazi, a city nearly the size of Charlotte, could suffer a massacre that would have reverberated across the region and stained the conscience of the world. Two years ago, fault lines traveled to Libya as US and NATO-backed rebels fought to overthrow Muammar Gaddafi. It was the only direct US military intervention in the unrest that was sweeping the Arab world. Now, Benghazi is a byword for political scandal, an obsession of politicians and the media in Washington after the murder of an American ambassador in 2012. I cannot imagine sending folks out to Benghazi after what we saw from the security cameras and the drones. Mistakes were made. And I have said that what Benghazi is worse than Watergate. Meanwhile, on the ground, a country is unraveling, torn apart by the very militias the US and NATO helped to support. Fault Lines is here to find out what went wrong. On November the 16th, after Friday prayers, a peaceful demonstration formed in a residential neighborhood in Western Tripoli. Local residents were protesting against the armed militia presence in their neighborhood. They were met with machine gun fire. When the shooting stopped, dozens of people lay dead. Many more were injured. The massacre took place the day we arrived in Libya. By the time we reached the scene, the men there told us the killers had left. The militiamen who'd taken over the area were from the Libya Shield, a militia that was set up by the Libyan government last year, but was largely decommissioned after some of its members opened fire on anti-militia demonstrators in Benghazi in June 2013, killing more than 30 people. Some of the Libya Shield fighters said they had been present when the shooting here happened. All that we spoke with were supportive of their brothers in arms. So they're showing us this graffiti on the walls saying Muammar Gaddafi is still here. They're saying that this is a sign that there's a lot of support still for the former regime and they're blaming those supporters on the violence that took place yesterday. طبعا احنا قوة درع ليبيا مكلفين بشكل رسمي من حكومة من قبل رئاسة الأركان بتأمين العاصمة In another part of the city the family of one of those killed held a mourning ceremony When Abdul Razak went to the hospital morgue to identify the body of his nephew he was horrified at what he saw Half the body is missing then my, my nephew, the body is out. Only a piece of muscle holding the other half. That day we bury 44 bodies. This one, the bullet is still in his body. This one, I show you, the bullet, big bullet, like this. Like that? Yes. If they come to Moscow, we don't come for fight, we look for war. To ask them peacefully, leave three bullets alone. There's people waving white flags. It's like, we came with the flowers and flags, white and uh, uh, olive, olive oil uh, branches. The whole Libya, mm -hmm. you understand? Yeah. To be really well united, we love each other. Mm -hmm. doesn't, doesn't matter from where you come from. Mm -hmm. From the desert, from uh, sea, from uh, east, west. We'd like mm -hmm. to be like before. Mm -hmm. Strong and tight, mm -hmm. we love each other. In Libya right now, assassinations, bombings and kidnappings take place almost daily. Security is in the hands of heavily armed, mostly unregulated militias with various regional and political loyalties. Abdul Razak's belief in a strong central government, like the one that existed under Gaddafi, 
is rejected by separatists around the country that complain Gaddafi favoured some cities while leaving others impoverished. In most of the country, the central government exists in name only. Well, this is yet another burial taking place, and there's coffin after coffin being carried into this cemetery. There were more than 30 people killed in yesterday's violence, and the scenes here are just remarkable. Frustration is boiling over. The mourners here say the militiamen who now roam freely are worse than Gaddafi. <laughs> The men who carried out the massacre were from Misrata. a port city about two hours east of Tripoli. When they entered Tripoli during the war, they were hailed by many as liberators. But Libya's Prime Minister Ali Zaydan has called for all militias to withdraw from the capital. It's not the first time he's made that demand. I think we're at a stage of on the brink of anarchy, if you will, and, and some of the things and some of the situations we have seen border on that. There is a complete lawlessness. These groups and these individuals have been operating with near impunity these past two years. Nobody is being held accountable for any of these violations. Hanan Salah is a human rights monitor who's been working in Libya since before the revolution. She was one of the first on the scene after the recent massacre but she says the violence is just part of a much larger crisis that the US and international community should have anticipated. The forced displacement of around 40,000 people really uh, showcases everything that went wrong in this revolution. This is a very, very serious issue uh, because the, the crimes that have been committed against the people of Tawirga, meaning the combination of crimes of the forced displacement of around 40,000 people, the ongoing uh, detentions of around 1,000 people that are held without charges, uh, the, the cases of tortures, deaths in custody, uh, uh, harassment that we see, the combination of these crimes really amount to a crime against humanity. Hanan told us about a refugee camp on the outskirts of Tripoli for the residents of an entire city in central Libya, all of whom had been displaced. These families have been here for about two years now, and they're still here. They're from a town called Tawerga, which is near the city of Misrata, but they haven't been able to go back home since the revolution. Tawerga was used by Gaddafi's military to attack Misrata, and since the war ended, Tawergans have been pursued and regularly attacked by the militias. In our country, people are saying that, you know, the situation might not be perfect in Libya, but at least they have their freedom. How many of these women know somebody that's been detained? She's had two of her relatives detained? She's had her son detained. So everybody here has a relative, at least one relative that's been detained since the revolution. What, what happened with her son who's missing? When, when did he go missing? Yeah, it says here, it's, I don't know the exact date. He was missing in Sirt. In Sirt? Like, how long ago? Like a year ago? Or? At the beginning of the event. The beginning of the revolution. 
I don't know why anyone fantasized, I think, in the endorphin of the revolution, the endorphin period of the revolution, as I call it, um, that somehow uh, Gaddafi would be overthrown and out of his head would spring uh, Dubai. Deborah Jones is Washington's new ambassador to Libya. She admits that the U.S. role here has been hamstrung by the death of her predecessor, Ambassador Chris Stevens, and three other Americans. We were much more cautious. We're much more heavy. You know, we go out. I mean, protecting people is very important to us. It's also, let me be honest, uh, we can't afford the political uh, backlash again in the United States. You know, this is where you want to talk about what causes paralysis. She did tell us that Libya's security was a major priority for the U.S., but that plans to help demobilize the former rebels and start training a new Libyan army hadn't even got off the ground yet. We've undertaken to train six to eight thousand. So six to eight thousand American, or I mean, uh, uh, U.S. training. So what, is is there any any timeline that you can give on when that might be right. completed? Well, I mean, it's obviously you can't just line up you know, 500 or 2,000 people and to take them off. And then, and then the training itself, um, the, the, the size, to have a significant force is not going to be on the ground until 2015. Why do you think it's taken so long to get to this point? I mean, some would say that's actually needed now. You know, frankly, that's a good question, and I can't answer that because I wasn't here before. Again, everyone was so excited about the overthrow and the vision and the promise in the future and I think uh, there was maybe, maybe there was not enough focus, whether by Libyans or others, on the really hard work of saying, we need to reintegrate this, and oh, by the way, not everyone's intentions are good, and oh, by the way, we're a small, wealthy country. People are going to take advantage of us. Before dawn, Abdullah al raqai leaves his house in Tripoli for prayers at the local mosque. Until October, it was a trip he made regularly with his father, Mohammed, a man best known by his nom de guerre, Abu Anas al-Libi. But on the morning of October the 5th, Abdullah overslept, and his father went to prayers without him. What his father didn't know is that he was being watched. His car being followed back through the darkened streets, a group of armed men had been tracking him for weeks. At 6.40 a.m., just as he arrived home, they took him. It's incredible. You can actually see American special forces grabbing Anas al-Libi, putting a hood over his head and putting him in a van, driving him away. The whole thing captured on these video cameras, everything. The family's video of the raid shows three vehicles converging on the house, armed men pulling Al-Libi from his car and bundling him into a van. They were part of a US Delta Force team sent in just for that purpose. Al-Libi is now in New York awaiting trial, accused of involvement in high-profile Al-Qaeda bombings of American embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. His wife says he was in the group, but that they can't understand why such a raid would take place now and in the manner that it did. When, when did they realize he was in the hands of the Americans? In television. In television. And that must have been shocking for her. I mean, that he would be in the hands of the Americans, or was, was it a relief? والحكومة الليبية هي اللي تتولى أمر القبض عليه وتتولى يعني تسوية وضعه هو كان هكي يعني على أساس ماشي اللي نيابة العامة على أساس إنه يسووا له وضعه مع الحكومة الأمريكية. The fact that it was U.S. special forces who did the raid caused anger in Tripoli. يعني هو يا طريقتهم هم يحاربوا في الإرهاب على أساس هذه طريقتهم هي اللي تولد في الإرهاب الأمريكان لنا عامة. الخطف اللي يعملوا فيه والقتل والأشياء هذه بتولد ردة فعل عند الطرف الآخر. Two days after Al Libby's abduction, Prime Minister Ali Zaydan was also abducted and then rescued by different militias in Tripoli. It was unclear whether the two events were directly linked, though some Libyans claimed they were. Regardless, they underscored Libya's overarching problem: a power vacuum 
with a multitude of actors vying for control. We caught up with Zaydan as he spent the day traveling around Tripoli to tout a purported success, the agreement of some militia forces to withdraw from the capital. To what extent do international actions like the US raid to capture Anas al-Libi undermine your position here? And how much prior knowledge did you have of the raid before it took place? I mean, Al Libby is is a wanted person and has been, you know, openly asked for by the United States, you know, in request. I mean, there's a he's not a, not a secret that he's one of those accused of this. But he's been living openly in Tripoli. for about a month. He came back, or for about a year, he came back. So why couldn't you just follow the? Really? And who would we ask that for? What what government? We're building capacity here right now. That's what I'm telling you. We are in the process of helping the Libyan government build the kind of capacity that would enable them. Let me ask you a question then. Why, if they had that capacity, they are very well aware of criminal actions in Benghazi. Where has that gone? The Prime Minister has been quite vocal about the extent to which the raid to capture Anas al-Libi actually undermined his position and created problems for him. This is a man who's been wanted since 1998 uh, for killing large numbers of people, including some of my colleagues and friends. Uh, so to bring him to justice, rather, you know, we, this was not a... People have said to me, why didn't you uh, use a, a Libyan militia to do it? And I said, because the whole point was to bring him alive. That's Libya's dilemma. Militias affiliated with the central government have been accused by the UN of torturing their prisoners to death. But each time the government has ordered the militias to withdraw from the streets, it's invited them back as lawlessness spreads. But such dependence has lasting consequences. We visited one of Tripoli's largest prisons to see just how widespread torture is. His, yeah, his foot is still broken till now. His foot is broken? Yeah. How, how did it happen? Hassan is Zaid. It's because of the torture, they were beating me. They weren't beating me here. They were beating me in, a, in another prison, Buslim prison. I was, I was tortured more than once. He was being interrogated? Yeah, they were, they were, they were forced uh, interrogations. And what, what methods of torture were they using? What, what were yeah. they doing to him? Yeah, and what? Do other people have similar stories to him in other prisons? What's that, what's that injury from? Well, the prisoners in this cell say some of them have been here for two years now without seeing a judge or going to court or even being able to see a lawyer. More than 8,000 prisoners remain in Libyan jails since the beginning of the revolution. Most held by militias who don't answer to the government at all. These three men, all from Tuaga, had experienced torture while held by such a militia. Are they worried about being detained again? While some militias appear largely focused on score settling, others have set their sights on bigger prizes. Eastern Libya is where the rebels first found widespread support in their battle against Gaddafi. It's also where much of the country's oil wealth originates and is exported. 
but many here say the region has been historically neglected. So the security forces that protect these terminals defected to Ibrahim al Jadran a few months ago, and since then they've effectively shut down oil exports across eastern Libya. This commander and his men still wear uniforms that are marked Libyan Army. I mean, they've been through all this fighting before. They're ready to, to fight again. The man who runs this militia now appears to have a stranglehold on an estimated 50% of Libya's oil wealth. Ibrahim Jadran is one of the leaders of the movement that has emerged for a federal system that empowers eastern Libya, an area that's sometimes referred to as Barka. If his plans are realized, Benghazi would be a part of Barka. But for now, Libya's second largest city and the so-called cradle of its revolution are slipping into lawlessness along with the rest of the country. Well, the last time I was here was two years ago, just before the fall of Gaddafi. And every evening, this square would be full of jubilant supporters of the revolution celebrating the liberation of their city. Now, you can see the blast scars from a bomb that went off devastating this entire area, and we're hearing it's something that's happening now with increasing frequency. What is the difference between his army and all of the other militias that are running this country? What gives them any more legitimacy than any of the militias that we hear about? But I think it's easy to foresee trouble if you, if you know that Libya has one of the largest weapons arsenals that now fell into the hands of adrenaline-pumped revolutionaries. It's a charge that's firmly rejected by America's ambassador here. The US holds no responsibility, she told us, for helping to empower the militias that now flaunt the Libyan government's authority and commit abuses. You know, this is life. Life is full of difficult choices. Freedom is really messy, and it takes a lot of work. Democracy, as I say again, it's not a destination, it's a path. This is the hard work of it. What are the foundational principles around which all Libyans are prepared to coalesce? Uh, I would say that the international community made a commitment and failed. Uh, a commitment to support Libya through its transition, a commitment to help rebuild this justice sector, but they failed to do that even from the beginning. 